I didn't watch the clock. Amen. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. How many of you know that it, we could have been home without electricity right now and all this thing with this storm? So I thank God that we're able to be in the house of the Lord in air condition, that the storm didn't do anything more than it did. Amen. So let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. We don't want to just welcome everyone here today. Uh, okay, there we go, brother. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I was hearing something. I thought I was going crazy for a second. Amen. Uh, we're not sure if we live this morning. There's a possibility. So today is welcome to Christian Fellowship Church live, but maybe not so live. It may just be recorded and posted later. The uh, switcher that we use to go live is giving trouble hooking to the internet this morning. As right now, it's live. Okay, we live right now. Sorry if we lose y'all throughout the day. <laughs> but uh, just again, want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, do we have any first time visitors here today? Just raise your hand. We just want to say hello to you. Any first time? All right. What I want you to do is, since it's Father's Day, what I want you to do is this side of the church, I want you to look at that side of the church. And I want y'all to say happy Father's Day to them. On three, ready? One, two, three. Okay, hey, now let's return the favor. This side, look at that side and say happy Father's Day. On three, one, two, three. Happy All right, amen, amen. We got special things. Uh, we're joking uh, in the back. Uh, they said, you know, we, we got a free gift for every father. If you're a father, please make your way to the back. We have a free gift for you. It's a, uh, they, they said, well, with their pastor being a share of me, they're not surprised it's a knife. So <laughs> there's a little knife for every father back there with CFC logo. It's one of those Swiss Army knife things. Um, but we are also giving away three Visa gift cards after worship service, uh, three $50 gift cards. Uh, so if you're a father, you, please go back there and make sure you get a little ticket for later uh, for a after worship service. So that, that's where we'll be with that. So again, we just want to have everyone uh, stay connected with us on <clears throat> up to date. Uh, if you would notice, we have a QR code you can scan in your bulletin, and we have many different ways you could stay in touch with us online. Uh, Brother Matthew, if you wouldn't mind switching over to the next uh, slide, please. Are we there? Okay, well, he's editing something right now. So let, let's, uh, let's uh, move on. Again, you can stay up to date with us on Facebook, YouTube. We have a CFC website, CFC apps. Uh, different things there. Uh, on this Tuesday, all ladies are invited to the women's Bible study. Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. in the cafe. It's every Tuesday night. Right now they're studying lies women believe. Uh, they got a, a few more weeks of it, and then they're going to switch uh, to another Bible study. So uh, you do not need the book to attend the Bible study. Okay, Be clear on that. Every week is a different lie they address uh, that that women believe it. And it's not really just women, it's that people believe. This week it's lies about your children, lies that you believe about your children. Uh, so um, uh, uh, come on out to that. Again, you don't need the book. They'll uh, work with you while, you while you're there. Then on uh, Wednesday night, we have discipleship class, kids club, and uh, extreme youth. So come on out to that. Our discipleship class we focus in three areas. What is a disciple? It's a student, one who learns, becoming one of Jesus' disciples. So what we do is we carry over all three bases that the Bible talks about that's important for a believer. The first thing we do is we worship God. We worship with music and song. And then we get into the Word, and then we end in prayer. So we, we try, we're trying to keep about 20 minutes worship, 20 minutes Word, and 20 minutes prayer. So come on out for... Uh, for, for on Wednesday nights. Um, then on Friday, this Friday, will be the, my sister's heart's women's ministry meeting. Uh, Sister Ruth Broussard will be speaking that night, and their theme this um, uh, month is Women of the Word. So come on out for that. And then on Sunday, June 27th at 6 p.m. is our men's fellowship supper in the gym. Brother Terry Godet is going to be sharing the word, and we're going to be eating some good gumbo. We haven't had gumbo in a while at our men's meeting. I know it's getting summertime, but you, you can't go wrong. We got air conditioning. Gumbo's good. 
at any time of the year. Uh, so I want to encourage you guys to come on out for that. And then uh, on Monday, June 28th, is my sister's heart's book club. Again, the book club is different than the Bible study. The book club meets once a month uh, from 5 to 8 in the uh, uh, cafe. And what they do is that every month they pick a different book that they read and then they come together and talk about the book there. Uh, and then lastly, on Wednesday, June 30th, will be our next water baptism service. So if you haven't been water baptized since you've given your heart to the Lord, I want to encourage you uh, to do that. Be there that night, Wednesday, uh, June 30th, uh, for water baptism. So I just want to take this moment and wish everyone having a, a birthday between now and next Sunday. Happy birthday. Anyone in here having a birthday between now and next Sunday? Raise your hand. I see in the back. Andrew, you are? All right. How, how old are you going to be, Andrew? 28. All right, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Andrew Burden. 28. Amen. All right, over there. Happy birthday. How old are you going to be? 21. Hey, yeah. I, I love to think back on, you know, when you, before you were 21 and all these ages, you, oh, I can't wait to get older, I can't wait to get older, then you move around 30 and it's, uh, I'm not so excited no more. Get closer to 40, I'm even less excited. When you get around 50, you don't like the birthday, but you still like the cake, right? <laughs> so, it, we, we got to take the bad with the good, so, uh, amen. So, I uh, just want to, again, wish anyone else a birthday? Happy birthday. If you're watching online, if we are online still, happy birthday to you. What about anyone having an anniversary between now and next Sunday? Right? Sister Sybil, your anniversary? Oh, how many years? 55 years. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anyone else uh, in the back over there? How many years? 30 years. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. Happy anniversary. Anyone else? All right. Go, gone once, gone twice, or forever hold your peace. Amen. <laughs> hey, anyone online, we just want to wish you a happy anniversary also. So as we get ready to receive our morning tithes and offerings, I just want to let you know how you can give if you're not here in service. Uh, maybe, maybe we're still online. I don't know. Well, are we still online? All right, we're online. Hey, how y'all doing? All right, <laughs> doing good. So how you can give is you can mail it to Christian Fellowship Church, P.O. Box 1427, La Rosa, Louisiana. Or you could uh, give online at uh, welcometocfc.com. There's a link there. Or you could text to give uh, to that phone number there. You could pause the video later on and text to give to that. But the best way to give is to be in the house of God. Amen. We love seeing your smiling faces and uh, worshiping together. So if you would, stand to your feet as we uh, read the scriptures this morning, as we get ready to give this morning. <coughs> Our scriptures this week is from the Good News Translation. The first one is from Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. It says, Remember what happened long ago. Acknowledge that I alone am God and that there is no one else like me. From the beginning, I predicted the outcome. Long ago, I foretold what would happen. I said that my plans would never fail, that I would do everything I intended to do. And Psalms 139 verses 1 through 6 says, Lord, you have examined me and you know me. You know, the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves sometimes. <coughs> And, you know, sometimes we, we, we also often pray for things in our life that God says, you know, that very thing is the thing that would destroy you. And that's sometimes why God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want him to. Amen. But he says, you know everything I do. From far away you understand all my thoughts. You see me whether I'm working or resting. You know all my actions. Even before I speak. You already know what I'm going to say. Uh, anybody spouses like that? No. <laughs> Amen. Even before I speak, I, you already know what I will say. Verse 5 says, You are all around me on every side. You protect me with your power. Your, your knowledge of me is too deep. It is beyond my understanding. So take your offering, hold it in your right hand, and repeat after me this morning. Say, as I give in today's offering... 
I have faith in the all-knowing God I serve. He knows everything, and his knowledge is totally true and accurate. There is nothing too hard for him. He is never surprised. God has a clear understanding of my life, my problems, my challenges, and my resources. God knows how to take care of me. In Jesus' name we pray. So if you would, just make your way out your seats and bring your offering. We've got three baskets along the front. Uh, Brother Kevin, are you going to strum anything for us here as they come up? Come on up and bring your offerings. give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. I I don't know if y'all noticed this, but up on the platform, we got a Kevin 1.0 and a Kevin (laughs) 1.5. I just want to thank Braden. I didn't even know Braden played the guitar. I think he just started in September and is already. Thank God Rachel has so much talent that she, uh, (laughs) (laughs) amen. He took after his dad with his guitar skills there. Amen. Thank God that God blesses us and things. So let's have our call to worship this morning. Once we begin worshiping, just a reminder, the altars are open if you want to come worship the Lord in the altar. Our our call to worship for the month of June is Psalms 105, verses 1 through 3. It says, Hallelujah. Thank God. Pray to him by name. Tell everyone you meet what he has done. Sing him songs, belt out hymns, translate his wonders into music. Honor his holy name with hallelujahs. You who seek God, live a happy life. So let's belt out a good hallelujah to him right now on three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. (laughs) Father, we just come to you this morning. We turn this entire service over to you this morning, Father God. We ask that you have your way in this place, Father God, that your spirit moves freely in this place as we come to worship you. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. And let's shout a good hallelujah again. Let's stand to our feet and worship. I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures for faith And every now And you came along And put me back together And every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. He's the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley. There's 
not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing, nothing Everything and nothing less 
your voice to him this morning and praise him. Come on, keep your voices going. We worship you, Jesus.
can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is the place that you promised to be not enough unless you come will you meet me here again cause all As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness, you'll go. Not enough Unless you come Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want Is all you are Will you meet me here again? I'm not
full of broken stones But you delight in the offering You have the heavens to call your home But you abide in the song we sing Ten thousand angels surround your throne Bring you praise that will never cease. But hallelujah from here below is still your favorite melody. And we sing hallelujah, 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 and we sing. Should the fire that once burned bright Become an ember my eyes can't see I will remember your sacrifice I will abide in your love for me And we sing hallelujah, hallelujah What a wonderful day to come When every knee bows before your name But we will not wait until it does For here and now shall your kingdom reign Then we say
giving himself his son and his Holy Spirit. Thank you. So you be happy. Shout that hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give God him a, bless. Give him your give best God praise a, this God morning. God the praise. The praise. Come on, give him the hallelujah. praise he deserves this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you this morning. Amen, amen. God bless you. You could be seated. Normally, we'd be dismissing our kids right now, but we have a special thing we want to do for Father's Day. Um, first, I want every father just to stand up right now. We just want to give you a hand clap of praise. Look at all the good-looking dads in here. Amen. Amen. Now, dads, if you did not, when you came in, if you did not get a ticket in the back, I want you to hurry up and go there right now. Uh, we're going to be giving away some uh, uh, three dollars Visa cards uh, to three dads. So we wish we could do something for everybody more. We did get everybody, uh, all the dads, a, a little pocket knife, CFC, Swiss Army knife. Uh, we're not responsible if you cut yourself now. So, uh, so ask your wife if she lets you play with the knife before you play with it. Okay? <laughs> but uh, what I want to do, uh, everybody's got their ticket. There's not a dad in here that doesn't have a ticket. All right. So what we want to do today is uh, Sister Wendy or, or one of them would come bring up the tickets here. Amen. And what we're going to do for the first ticket is I'm going to ask all the kids in club three, four, five, and Sister Michelle, you can just put it there, to come on up right here, and they're going to pick the first ticket. Sister Mich so if you're in club 345, get up and come with Sister Michelle right here. We, any of them are here today? Yeah, they come on up. Don't be scared. They're nervous to come in. Oh, the beautiful children. Amen. Uh, parents, if, if, the, if they're too scared to come by themselves, you can come with them. Amen. Look how beautiful. Let's give the Lord a hand clap, amen, <laughs> for the blessings he puts in our lives as parents to shepherd over and watch over, amen. Look at this. Come on, let's stand to our feet and clap for them. We're so proud of them. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Get Michelle. Oh, wait, we got more coming. Come on. Yeah, we don't want to miss anyone. If, if they're three, four, or five years old, they go and miss Michelle's class uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we do have the nursery. We're not, we're not bringing the infants out right now, but we want to thank. Let's give a round of applause for the nursery workers that are helping back there right now. Amen. Always thankful for them. So they're going to pick the first ticket here. Make sure you pick mine. I don't have one, don't worry. <laughs> Amen. So let's see what we got here. Amen. All right, the last four digits. Zero, two, zero, four. Zero, two. Kevin Bankston. Hey, 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 hey. You want visa, visa, or visa? There you go. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll let this class go down. Y'all can actually, uh, well, y'all stay till we give away the next two. Then we'll dismiss our classes. All right. So for the next two, what I want is a new generation kids from uh, ages 6 through 11 that go to new generation and all their new generation leaders. Come on up here. Tucci, you and new generations already? Boy, you go, you're making Paul feel old. Look, y'all come in the middle, come in the middle. Come on, come on, come on. Man, look at this crew. Wow, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet and give them a hand clap of praise here. Beautiful kids. Look at his bunch. Munch a bunch of Captain Crunch. I like all this. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to have 
Let's start on this side. We'll have Sister Christy pick the first one. Now, if this falls on Naren, I know it's rigged. <laughs> Amen. All righty. Let me. Don't get old, KJ. Well, you already got glasses, so it don't matter. You might as well get old. Amen. The last four numbers, 0185. Brother Mark Culpepper, come on. All right. All right. My two new best friends, Mark and Kevin. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is have, come on this side, and how about Miss Allison? Miss Allison, now if you pick your dads, we're going to be worried. All right, thank you. All right, and the final one. is 0199, 0199, Noni, all right. Happy Father's Day to all of you, amen, God bless you. So what I want to do right now is I want all the kids to get with their fathers. Okay, families get together. Darren, you come down with your kids. Y'all go with your fathers. If, if the dads aren't here, we know some are working, some are offshore, different things. Uh, just kids get around your parents. Okay? Y'all can make your way back to your seats. Uh, I want to just pray, pray a special prayer over everyone right now, every family right now. Okay, so let's get, let's get families together. They dumped you, Grace? <laughs> Amen. So what I want to do is I want everyone just to stand as a family together. And I'm going to read this prayer that Paul prayed over the Ephesian church. And I want to pray it over your life right now. And this is going to be part of my message after. But I wanted to pray this over. As if everyone just stretch your right hand toward me. And this is what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And I want to pray it over our Christian fellowship families right now. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you, fathers, husbands, mothers, wives, children, with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You, you received that this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. So at this time, I want to dismiss Club 345 and new generations to their classes. Amen. Everyone else, you can take out your notes as we get ready to start our message this morning called chapter 47. Uh, amen. Now, uh, it's Father's Day. I know some of you have uh, reservations, maybe somewhere to eat. Don't worry, I'll get you here, out of here by two, because I know none of you, you know, would have made a reservation before two, uh, you know, to go eat. So, <laughs> But let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now as we start. Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for each and every person that's here. Father, I ask that your spirit be here with us, Father God, that you move in this place, Father God. I pray today that as I speak, Father God, every deaf ear could be open to the spiritual truths of your word. 
every blind eye could be open to the spiritual truth of your word this morning. Father, that every mind could comprehend your word this morning. And Father, most of all, prepare our hearts to receive your word this morning. And as Paul also prayed, I pray that you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so we may know you better. In Jesus' name, we pray and everyone says, Amen. Amen. How many of you were here last week for the anniversary service? Brother Robert had, amen, good. Brother Robert had uh, gave a message that really resonated with me. I really enjoyed it. And he, he mentioned two, two, three types of people that we have. We have the, you have satisfied people, which are, is good just the way it is. So I don't need to work on change. I don't need to do this. Then he talked about there's dissatisfied people that grumbling and complaining. And it's that happiness will never find you because wherever you're at, you're grumbling and complaining. And then he said he, he wants a church of unsatisfied people. And the unsatisfied was that it's, it's, we're, we're thankful and we're glad for God's grace and all this. But as long as there's an empty seat on the side of me, there's another lost soul that could be filling that seat. That we never come as a church to a place that we're satisfied with, with where we are. The, the, the Bible constantly talks about growth, to share, to grow. And we never have to uh, become, need to become complacent. And I had told, I'd said I read an article earlier that week that most people share their faith within the first five years of their new birth, rebirth. And then they slowly stop. Because... In the very beginning, they're so excited and they can't help but tell somebody else. But then they become satisfied with where they are. And they begin to quit sharing the gospel with other people. And we don't want that to happen. And uh, chapter 47, for those of you that aren't here, is really just talking about this is the 47th year of Christian Fellowship Church. Last year, last week ended the uh, 46th year. And when... He was speaking, I, I just seen like a, a book that chapter 46 has ended. Every year is an is a end, and every near year is a new beginning. So as we move to the 47th year of Christian Fellowship Church, it was that the pages are blank, and God wants to write our story. And the, here's what I'm talking about today is what part of that story you're going to be. I hope we could be a radical church that loves people, that, that doesn't get satisfied, that we're always trying to reach people. And can I tell you something? It's not just my job to reach people. It's all ours. Right? The shepherd does not make sheep. The shepherd tends the sheep, leads the sheep. But it is the sheep's job to make other sheep. And that's where we, we understand that the Bible says that once you're born again, God gives you the ministry of reconciliation. That is your job. You, you want purpose in life? That is one purpose. That it is to reconcile, to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's our job. That's what we do. And so as we're starting chapter 47, we won't know what it looks like until we get to chapter 48. But I'm believing that chapter 47 could be some, one of the best years of the whole 46 years but w with God, for, for God doing things. So let's, let's just quickly get into our notes here again. And I, I want to talk about uh, what we're, let me just read what, uh, the prayer I prayed over you and just touch a few things there as we go. It says, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth de derives its name. And I pray out of his glorious riches that he may do what? Strengthen us. We need to be strengthened through his spirit in our inner being. So then the reason is, is that so Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. You know, a lot of times people struggle with faith. And Jesus, on Wednesday nights, I, I talk a lot about this. Uh, so I don't remember if I shared this on Sunday morning or not. <laughs> so... But Jesus, one of Jesus' problems he had uh, with people, one of the biggest things that upset him was those that wanted to constantly see a sign. That they needed to see a miracle to have faith. That they needed to, he needed to heal somebody. He needed to do this 
for, in order for them to have faith. And, and that's what he says. You're, you're this generation, he says, how long will I be with you to keep showing you these miracles? He says, but blessed are those who have not seen, but still believe. He's saying, blessed are those who have not seen a miracle, but still believe. You see, that's what faith is. See, it's not hard for me to believe that there's a clear pulpit right here in front of me because I could touch it and feel it. Right? It's not hard for us to trust in what we see. It's hard for us to trust and have faith in the answer that isn't there yet. It's hard to trust and believe in a God that, that we haven't seen. But he, again, you can ask everybody in here, they'll raise their hand, has God ever done a miracle in your life? And sure. But how many of us still tr- struggle with faith when we reach the next problem? Right? So Christ to dwell in us, to give us faith. He says, uh, verse 18, uh, I mean, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that being rooted and established, we need to set roots in God's word so when the world comes and things, it doesn't throw us over and being established, being there in love. Verse 18 says that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and how deep the love of Christ is and to know this love that surpasses knowledge is beyond what we can understand. Can I, can I just stop here a minute and let you know, just because you do not understand something of God doesn't make it not real. Reality is, if you, if you totally understand God, he, that's not the real God. You've limited God and shrunk him down to what our human pea brains can understand. See, the Bible says, again, we're about to get to to him who could do immeasurably more than we can even imagine. So God is bigger than what you can even imagine. So as big as you can imagine God, he's bigger. Your mind cannot comprehend how big God is, how, how great his mighty work and power is. You cannot. So it's okay to not understand. If you do understand, there you have a problem. You shrunk God down to what fits in a box. See, God is, the, the Bible is clear. It even says, for now we only know in part. We only know in part. We're finite moral beings. He's an infinite, infinite God. He's so much bigger than we are. And then we'll go on to say uh, that you may have the power with the Lord to grasp how wide and how long and how deep is the love of Christ and to know a love that surpasses knowledge, to surpass anything you know. Knowledge means to know, that very first four letters, to know, which you could even know. He says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, let me clear this up for you. You're never going to have the fullness of God. You never could be filled with the fullness of God because he's more than we can measure or imagine. But he says that you would be filled to what you could hold. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about today. You, you as a person can only hold so much of God in you, and the pr- problem is you also hold yourself in you. You see, God is spirit, but we are still flesh and mortal. And, the, and uh, we read the other day where it says, where John said, uh, he, he needs to increase and I need to decrease. You see, and that, that's what we're going to talk about today. He wants to fill you, but he can't fill you if you're so full of you. The only way he could fill you with him is to get some of you out. You, you know, this bottle could only hold whatever it is. 16 ounces, I don't know what they are, I can't see. <laughs> but, it, but it's a bottle of water. If I want to put Coke in here, the bottle holds 16 ounces, but I cannot put 16 ounces of Coke in here unless I first take out the 16 ounces of water. You see, and some of us are so full and don't want to give up things in our life. And, and the, the worship songs, the, the, some of the lyrics today, I'm going to trip and make a mess here. Some of the worship songs that we were talking about today where, where it talked about uh, 
There's, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. And we worship and we sing that. And, oh, Lord, there's nothing better than you. And a sacrifice, a, everything and nothing less. We sing it, but we don't live it. Right? If, if, if there's truly nothing better than him and we truly believe it, then how come we don't give him everything and let us be filled with the measure of him? Why do we hang on to us so much? Why do we not allow him to... You know, what, what a lot of people do is, God, here are my broken pieces. Here is my messed up life. Here is my broken things that bring things. And I want you to have that. But this area over here, I kind of want to keep for myself. See, we got to give him all of it. He doesn't want, he could take the broken pieces and fix it. But you know what? A lot of times is that actually the pieces we keep are the reasons those pieces are broken. And we want him to fix it, but then we're still doing the same thing. I'm going to tie this together. Don't worry. We're going to get into scripture here. What verse was I on? Where am I? Verse 19, and to know that, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do, what is that word? What is it? What does that mean? You not can't even measure it. It's beyond what we can comprehend, beyond what we can measure. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or even imagine. According to what? His power that is at work within us. He says, so to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout when? All generations for how long? Forever and ever. So in other words, to this day, today. It's still a real word for today. Forever and ever. So as, as I'm doing this, I just want to kind of share a little bit of, of my story tied in with this of, in my life. And um, so somebody, you're probably going to have to put some cotton balls in my mom's ear. I don't know. If, I don't want her to hear You know, sometimes when you confess things in front of your mom that, you know, it's kind of bad. <laughs> she might not get me none for Christmas this year. She might say, you were naughty. <laughs> but so here's the thing. How do we change? How do we become? The, the Bible says that we are uh, God's workmanship created to do good works that God has prepared for us to do in advance. And can I tell you something? Until you're fulfilling that purpose in your life, your life is always going to seem empty, something missing. Until you do what God created you to be, your life will never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied. You'll, you'll go from this to that to everything else in the world. Tr why? Because you're trying to find something to satisfy you. But you will never be satisfied until you're doing the will of the Father in your life. So how do I change? This is what I want to talk about. I remember before I got, my wife got saved before me and yeah, I was just out in the military and young and kind of wanted to do my own thing, you know, and I, I, I believed in God. I knew there's a God who well, raised up in church and I knew God, I believed in God and all this thing. And, and I always said this, well, when I'm going to be about 55, this is what I said to myself. You, you'll say, boy, he had some weird conversations with himself. But this is where I was. I was probably 20, early 20s. I said, you know, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. I'm going to have all my fun, the carnal fun that I want to have. And then at about 55, before I die, I want him to get right. <laughs> you know, about 55, once I'm getting older where uh, all this thing I want, to, I want to do right now is over, then, God, you could have what's left. But God wants more than that from us. You know, and I'd say uh, back in the 90s, me and a couple of friends had just a garage band, 
playing all kind of worldly music and um, I, 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 a, a moment in my life I'll never forget that it's a God moment. I had given my heart to the Lord probably six months earlier. I was still drinking and smoking pot. Oh, you're supposed to stick your fingers in her ear. <laughs> Mom, I'm sorry. I repent, please. <laughs> and and doing those things and playing this music in an old house, an old shed, and I, I really believe that once I quit, that the, his, this guy's neighbors probably were real happy because we made some, no, we had some noise pollution. That's all it was. I don't know what it was. So you know, it's, you turn the knob to ten and you break it off on eleven, and that's it. Just make noise. And hopefully you're all playing in the same key. But Su- Suzanne, my, my wife, would always tell me, you know, you know, trying to lead me in the right direction. And I, I, I honestly believed this. I was believing the lie of the devil. That I didn't need to quit doing things like that. That that was perfectly okay. Because in my mind, I was saying, oh, what a witness am I to my friends. That... I could be saved and still do what they're doing. Still participate in that. And that's what I believed in my heart. Oh, they're going to come to know the Lord through that. Well, can I tell you they didn't? The only thing that was happening was holding me from growing closer to God. Until one day we were actually playing music and I think the song was we're going down to Sin City from ACDC. Sin City, uh, we, we, I forget the name of it. Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm on the highway to hell. That was the name of the song. And how, path- how, how prophetic was that? You know? And in the middle of the song, I was, everything seemed great, and a voice in my head that was, could have been on a PA system said to me, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Me or the world? And it's just like that. It was like a, we quit. I, I ended practice early that day and left. I, I knew I should. At that moment, I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Something inside of me changed, and it was like what I loved and lived for. I knew it wasn't right anymore. And so I left and never went back. And my life has changed since then. Because I truly believe if I would have, would have stayed there that day, I wouldn't be here. This, 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 God was saying, that today you're choosing. I got a path for you, or are you going to take your own path? And I, I'm so glad I chose the path that God had for me. So how do, the, amen, let's hit, give him all the glory. My wife, who was a praying wife, uh, praying for me in these things and directing me and poking me when I needed to be poked and you know and I was like, quit 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 aggravating me with that God stuff but she knew what she had to do yeah okay, so uh, we understand that so let, let's look because I really want chapter 47 to be a radical change in every one of our lives that we are going to really say God I give you everything but not just say it but actually do it. That we're going to not only say there's nothing better than you, if there's nothing better than Him, so why aren't you giving all in? Because maybe we think there's something better. So let's look at Romans chapter 8, chapter 6, verses 8 through 14. It says this, Now if we died with Christ, talking about for our salvation, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And it says, the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. He paid, Christ died for the forgiveness of all our sins so we can live through him. So we could have him living in us and we can live through him that even though we die in this mortal body, we can live. The, Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he's talking about believers there. And then it goes on to say this. 
Uh, verse 10, the, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. <clears throat> but listen to what it says about Christ. But the life he lives, he does what? Lives to God. So our life, if we want eternal life, life with him, died with him, our lives should be lived for God and not for us. Then it says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And most people love that first part, those few verses. The problem is we get stuck on the second part. We want forgiveness of our sins. We want to be born again. We want to make it to heaven. But notice what he, he goes on to say now. He's, it basically, he's saying, so if you've done that, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, look what verse 12 says. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. Now, let me pause here for a second. Therefore, do not let sin. So it's in our control, in our mortal bodies, the... the uh, Scripture uses a lot of things about talking about the mortal body. In other words, your flesh. Uh, several verses talk about the carnal body. You know, the, the carnal body. Carnal means flesh, meaty. Uh, those desires. Uh, anybody ever had chili con carne? What is that? Con chili con carne is that carnal. Con carne is where it comes from. It means pieces of meat in the chili. So it's part of the carnal, our, our flesh. God is spirit. We're born again spirit. Our spirit is born again, but we still have this old flesh that wants to battle us. And he's God, God's saying, if you've, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, do not live to satisfy the flesh. You are, should have died to that, crucify that thing. You, that's why it says to crucify, to take up your cross each and every day so you don't sat, satisfy or gratify the flesh. Right? Give it all to Him. And then He goes on to say, uh, do not. Okay, let's, let's stop verse 12 again. It, it's not optional. Notice, He says, therefore, if you've accepted Christ, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Verse 13 says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather, here's the key, offer yourselves to God. You see, a lot of times people just want to do not. They, they hear and they go to church and everything about churches, you can't do this, you can't do that. God just, is just a bunch of do nots, but that's not the gospel. You see, He's saying, don't do this, but do this. In other words, and, and we'll get to it, God doesn't want to just remove things out of your life. He wants to put things in your life. But he can't place that in your life until you remove this. Right? There's only so much that'll fit. There's only so much. I don't know what. I, I don't like Coke. I'm, I'm going to say root beer. I like root beer. So we're going to change it to root beer. But there's only, you see, right now that much water is missing. So I can only fill that much root beer. See, and God's saying, until you get the other stuff out, he can't fill you with his spirit. That's why it says that you would be filled to the measure of what you could hold. Again, it's not the fullness of God because God is way too much. But that you could be filled. And let me just stop here for a second. I know, and everybody struggles with different sin in their life. There's a difference between struggling with a sin and actually allowing a sin. Because sometimes some people, oh, I've been struggling with this for so long. I, I, that's just the way it's going to be. God must have made me this way. No, he didn't. I always like to say, God formed you, sin deformed you, but Christ wants to transform you. Here, God formed you, sin deforms us, but Christ is to transform us back into the image of God. You were created in his image, but we, we are far from his image now. But so we are to be transformed in that. And, and this is what I want to say. I don't want you to feel condemned if you're struggling with sin. 
But if you accept the sin and don't care about the sin, you're not going to be forgiven for that sin. See, the Bible is clear. We talked about that this Wednesday night. God looks at the heart, not at the action. God looks at the heart of a person, not at the action. You see, like all the Ten Commandments and things were outward actions you look at. Thou shalt not murder, right? So when Jesus was asked about that, he, says, he said, Scripture says thou shalt not murder, which is an outside action. But he, he said, but if you hold hatred in your heart, you are just as guilty as murder. He was asked about adultery. Ten Commandments, don't commit adultery, the physical act of adultery, Jesus says. But reality is, if you look after someone lustfully in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. You see, God looks at the heart, the intent. God knows if you're struggling with a sin and trying to get, get, get out of it, get, overcoming, because there's things in life, sometimes God delivers us instantly. Sometimes we got to work. It, in Hebrews, it tells us to rid yourselves of the things that burden you, that aren't sins, that separate you from God, and the sin that so easily entangles you. See, he, sometimes he relies on us. It's your choice. You got to. You got to battle this flesh. This flesh, is until we... The Lord comes, we're always going to battle this flesh. So understand that I have to willfully want this to go, and that has to be my heart. Think about, I had shared a couple of Sundays ago with uh, Paul. I think it was Sunday, it could have been a Wednesday. Sometime between December 28, 1966 and now, I shared. That's when I was born. So, <laughs> so I know it was between there and then now. That to keep Paul from becoming conceited, God allowed a messenger from Satan into him, a, a thorn in his side, some things said. And we don't know what it was. The Bible doesn't clear. All we know that God was using it to make sure Paul didn't get conceited because of all the miracles things. But it says that Paul earnestly prayed for God to remove it. See, Paul, what didn't, did, even though it came from God, he didn't want it in his life. He says, this is, whatever this is, whatever this is, God, please take it away. You see, the heart of Paul was whatever that was, he didn't want it. See, sometimes people are okay with sin. Listen, if, if you got plans next Saturday night that include sin, that you know think you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, then you're not remorseful of it. You're planning it. You're accepting it. You're allowing that in your life. That's not a struggle. If, if you're marking the sin on your calendar, this day we're doing this. See, that means your heart's not right. It's not something you battled with on, on a th in an instant that you gave in the temptation. That you really want God to take out of your life. Let, let's get going. Uh, I'm sorry, taking long here. Verse 13 says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. This is ver verse 13. But rather offer yourselves to God. So he says, quit doing your, what you used to do and give it all to God. Isn't that what we were singing this morning? I sacrifice, I give it all to you. Keeping nothing for me. Uh, th this part of my life, this, this fleshly carnal thing I enjoy, that this body enjoys, I give it all to you, God, and I'm going to replace that with you. Then it says, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. And he says, if you do this, for sin shall no longer be your master. Think about that. That sin is a master to you. It's controlling you. But you should be controlled by the spirit. But you're, you're, you're being controlled by a different spirit. But if you do this, sin will no longer master you. And let, let me explain sin for a second. There's a couple of things with sin is. 
Sin is when we do what God tells us not to do. But can I also tell you sin is also when we don't do what God tells us to do. There's both, you know, most people think, well, here's the do not list. But sometimes God will speak to your life and speak into your life for you to do something and you kind of put it off. You don't do what you're supposed to do. See, that's sin too. Sin is not doing, uh, doing what God tells us not to do or not doing what he told me to do. So how do we change? Number one is I need to start getting rid of the excuses. I have to quit making excuses. Get rid of those excuses. I'll just share with you, there may be some in here that God already spoke to. You've given your heart to the Lord but you've never taken the next step to get water baptized. We're having water baptism at the end of this month. Sign up for it. It's always been, oh, well, the next time. Oh, they got this going on that night. Next time they do it. And you're putting it off. You're letting excuses come in the way of your next step with God. So look look what he goes on to say. John 10.10. The thief comes only, this is Jesus speaking, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. He deceives you through lies and through things. He makes you think things are a certain way when they're not. Uh, Again, with Adam and Eve, they thought what they were doing was going to make their life better. But it brought death, brought separation from God. It says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. And I always say this, to be born again, that you have new life. But he says not only that you be born again, but that you have a life to the full. The measure of God, the fullness of God in your life. That you may have life to the full. And so many Christians are living a life less than what Jesus died for. Jesus died for you to have a life in the full, to the full. And and so many of us, Don't live up to that, what he paid for. So I'm going to take you, uh, Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 20. Says this, Jesus was talking about a banquet thing, and how many know we're all invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb one day, we're going to be there, big celebration. And notice what he talks about here. Here, Here's somebody at the table says this, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. But notice what Jesus replies. He says, in other words, he's given a heavenly example of what's happening on earth. He says, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish and will be invited to that banquet. It's God's will that none should perish, but all come to repentance. Many are invited. He says, at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those uh, who had been invited. Now, these are the ones that already had the invitation. They all already had it. He says, come, now is the time. Come, everything is now ready. But verse 18 says, but they all alike began to make excuses. Making an excuse. To make something means you have to build or fabricate it. See, what he's basically trying to tell you is there's no excuse for missing it. But you have to build a reason why you are. And then he goes on to say this. They they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five uh, yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. 
Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Please excuse me. Another one says, I just got season tickets. Please excuse me. Another one says, but the big games today. Please excuse me. Another one says, but I'm too busy. Please excuse me. Another one says that I, I just bought a boat and the specs are buying. Please excuse me. Please excuse me. Uh, here's my excuse. Then Jesus says in verse 23, Then the, the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so my house will be full. And he says this in verse 24, But I tell you, not one of those who, in, who were invited will taste of my banquet because they had excuses in their life. They excuse, Other things came before him. I should have told you to wear some steel toe shoes this morning. Because I might be stepping on some toes. But how easy. That song, there's none, nothing better than you. Well, they just gave you a whole bunch of excuses of what was better. They just gave you a whole... You see, the devil has a way of making you put things before God when you don't even realize you're putting them before God. Revelations 3, 14 and 16 says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. And he wants you to be one. I want you to be hot, sold out, completely on fire. If you're not going to do that, he says, I really wish you would just say you hate me. He says, because of the... He says, I, I know your deeds, what you do, that you are neither cold nor hot. He says, in other words, you're not completely sold in. You didn't completely buy in. You didn't completely give me everything. He says, I wish you were either one or the other. And verse 16 says this. So because you are not all the way in, because you are wishy-washy, because you're still parts of your life you want to hang on to and not give it all to me, he says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. God wants all of you or none of you. He wants every single part of your life. And then a few verses down in 19, he says this. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Rebuke means that I show you your mistakes. I'm telling you where it's wrong. I'm correcting you. I'm going to discipline you. He says, so be earnest, which means of grave importance, and repent. Realize that you could sing that you've given me your all, but until you give me your all. See, because I know your heart. Your mouth may be saying one thing, but your heart is living something else. Your mouth saying that you're surrendering all, but your heart is all about you. So the first thing we need to do for chapter 47 is Quit making excuses of why. Why I'm not going to give it. At least admit it if you're not going to give it. That's what he wants you to do. Don't try and play like you gave him at all, but you're not. So the second thing is, after we quit making excuses, we need to make the break. We need to make the break. Again, excuses with me was, when I, oh, when I'm going to be 55. Later on in life, I, I just want to enjoy this time of my life. Because I didn't realize how, how much of a full life I could have serving Christ, which is by far better than any life I was living before. I'm happier now than when I, I was living in the world. Living in the world was miserable. You, you, you're trying to find the next thing to bring you pleasure for a while. The Bible says there's fun and sin for a season. But can I tell you something? That season's going to pass. And what used to bring pleasure is going to make you miserable. And you've got to search for something else. Why do you think people go to drugs? Because they want to change the way I feel because I, I'm not happy with myself. 
My life's not happy the way I feel right now. I need to change. I need, and so they go to drugs to ch- make that change in their life. And what they thought was making them feel great at first is going to end up killing them in the long run. Second Corinthians, make the break. Second Corinthians, and, and like I'm saying, I'm, I'm equating this with my life. I, I had to quit making the excuses. And when God said, choose this day, I had to make the break. Lifelong friends I had to make the break from because they, they were toxic to my relationship with God. So 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18 says, do not be yoked together. That means joined together with unbelievers. We need to witness the unbelievers, but we can't live in the same atmosphere as unbelievers, okay? We are light and they are d- d- darkness. Before you were born again, you were in darkness. What does light and darkness have to do? How can they stay together? He says, do not be yoked with unbelievers. I need to remove the bad relationships, the non-godly relationships, and replace them with good, healthy relationships. You see, again, don't get caught up in the just you can't. What God wants to do is remove unhealthy relationships and put healthy relationships in you. Remove ungodly relationships and put godly relationships in your life. The problem with a lot of new believers is we just try and remove the other stuff and we never replace it. So we feel empty. That's why we need to be filled with God. That when we, when we allow God to remove one relationship, we replace it with a godly relationship. You can't be in two places at one time. You only could go on one of those relationships. For what do righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Bilal? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? What is an idol? Something that is lifted up above God. And it says this, For we are the temple of the living God. We are. So you are the temple of the living God. And God says, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. And we all love that. But then verse 17 says, you can't take verse 17 out of this. It's all part of what he's saying. Therefore, so if you want me to be to your God and you want, want to be my people, he says, therefore, come out from them and be separated, says the Lord. So the Lord says, yes, I will be your God. I will walk with you. You will be my people, says the Lord. But he also says, therefore, if you want that, you need to be separated. (coughs) I'm going to lose my voice here in a second. (coughs) Then he goes on to say, touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 33 through 34. Do not be misled. What does, what does the word misled mean? Believing something that's not true. Don't, don't think that it's one way. He says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. But it's, it's a lot easier for you, your friends, ungodly friends, to bring you down and have you go back into the world than it is for you to bring them to God. We need to try and bring them to God, but living their lifestyle isn't going to happen. You have to take a stand and say, look, I love you. We, we've been friends, but I need to work on my relationship with God. Maybe I need to break away from you for a while. And you see those... those Guys that, uh, that I was playing with music with, it, w- it was four years before I really kind of talked to many of them. I, you know why? Because if I went around them, I became like them. I wasn't strong enough yet to stand my ground. So it's very critical, especially as a new believer, to break away. That's how you make that change. You have to... Look... 
Uh, I always use this example with, um, I love sweets. During the day, I, I, don't, I really don't crave sweets, but something happens, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When it becomes dark, I start wanting sweet. And if it's in my pantry, I will eat it. I will, I'll, I've become a scientist at night when I don't have sweets in the pantry. I'm trying to concoct something up that's going to that's gonna taste sweet. But you see, not, now that my... Here's Scott's excuses. My granddaughter is not living with us no more. They live in Youngsville. I don't have to keep the sweets in the thing. I don't, so I don't buy it when I go to the store. So it's not there. You see, I have to break away from it because if it was there, I'd give in to the temptation. And do I still give in when she comes over and visits and I go to the store and that's why I love taking her to the store. Oh, don't, don't you want this? Oh, babe. You want to buy you some honey buns? <laughs> we make excuses. We need to take those things out of our life that we know we struggle with. So the areas in your life that you know you struggle with, you need to remove them so you don't fall into that temptation and give in to it. Right? It's, it's like saying we're going to have a, the next Weight Watchers meeting is going to be held at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> right? Well, you're asking for failure. You're setting yourself up for failure. So don't set yourself, your life up for failure. He says, uh, do not be misled, uh, bad company corrupts good character. And he says this, because he's speaking to believers. He says, come back to your senses. He says, I don't know what happened, but somehow you went off track. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there is some uh, uh, who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Believers, you've been misled. You need to come back to God. You know better. You know better. And there's so many times people know knows better, but they do it anyway. Again, I know better than to eat all that junk. Hey, look, I'm down 20-something pounds. I'm doing good. Want 20 more to go. I said that in front of you. Now I've got to be more accountable. <laughs> but that's what we need in our life is accountability. You see, so I ne we need to take those things, those stumbling blocks out of our life and surrender those things to God, give it to God. We can't hide them, right? I'm not going to say I've ever hid some of the sweets I bought for my granddaughter where she couldn't find them so I could find them. That's a possibility that could have ha happened. He says, so third thing, again, we, we said we've got to quit making excuses. We've got to make the break. And the third thing, final thing, is we need to fill the void. And this is kind of what I've been trying to get across as we've been talking about this, is fill the void. Where you remove something, it needs to be filled back. Where you remove something that God wants out of your life, you need to fill it with something of God. Or you're still going to be feeling the emptiness, not being full. So connect with God. Give 100% of your life to Jesus. Again, you'll notice some of these things are what's in our for you there, our steps uh, in discipleship. Connect with God. Give 100% of your life to, to Jesus. Notice what Ephesians 5.18 says. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. That word debauchery means fleshly desires. Right? I don't think a person, I don't, we would have a hard time to find a person that would say, you know what, when I was completely drunk, I made the best decision of my life. You'll find the total opposite, right? Man, I was drunk, I don't know why I made that decision, right? 
when, when, when you're not in your right mind, you'll tend to make the wrong decision. And that's debauchery is, it says this leads. It, 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 the, the drinking of the wine says that your spiritual senses is, is going to come down and you'll end up doing something you wouldn't have normally done. Many people probably have regrets that in the past life, you know what? I was drunk and I made a stupid decision. Put your fingers in my mom's ears. But she knows this. When I was in the military, uh, drinking and driving, drunk and saying, you know what? I could go ahead and I could still drive a car. Well, they pulled me over. Got caught. Uh, I had two years. I lost driving privileges on the base and all these things. And because in my mind, I could do it. It was a dumb decision. I didn't know you're supposed to stop at a stop sign when there's a... a <laughs> That's what happened. I drove straight through a stop sign. Thank God nobody else was coming. There was no accident. But there was a cop sitting there, and he seen me drive right, right through. But yet, in my mind, I thought I was perfectly capable. Right? So that's why he says, don't do these things because you're going to end up making decisions you're going to regret later. He says, so instead of being filled with wine, it says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. And that's the Spirit of God, not the alcohol spirit. Okay? The Spirit of God, instead of. In other words, fill the void. God's never saying for you to take this out of your life and leave an empty space. The Bible even talks about, about uh, demonic spirits and things. When you cast the spirit out to fill it, or that spirit's going to come back and find the room empty. And it's going to bring more spirits with it, and you're going to be worse off in the latter run than you were in the beginning. So when you remove something, you need to fill it. Next thing is connect with the family of God. You were never meant to uh, live this life alone. You were never meant to do this Christian thing alone in your life. Uh, Adam had a perfect relationship with God, but it's God that said it's not good for you to be alone. I want you to have somebody. And I'm not talking about just uh, husband and wife. And what we're talking about is connecting with God. That We have the women's groups, all those things, the men's group coming up. We have youth, children's church. Everything that you could connect with other believers. Right? Remove the toxic relationships with your life, and we, we want to give you every opportunity to build, replace it with godly relationships. People that will help you out. And I'm just going to use uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 8, and 12, this biblical principle that I want you to see through here. Uh, there's so many scriptures I could have used, but I chose this one. It says, There was a man alone. He had neither son nor brother. And, and we're talking talk about somebody who's trying to do this alone, away from the family of God, not being connected with uh, other believers. Uh, the Bible even says, don't forsake the gathering of his people, but that you come together and you encourage each one another. He says that there was no end to his toil. Again, when you're trying to do things on your own, it's so hard. It says, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. He says, two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good return for their labor. If one of them falls down, one can help the other up. You see, that's why you need good godly relationships that you have accountability with each other, and that when one stumbles, you, you got someone you could call that's going to help you and carry you through. And then it goes on to say, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And you see, that the, the principle through this is, again, you're trying to remove things through life, and you don't replace it with other things, and you're, you're stuck alone. You weren't made to do this alone. When Jesus came down, he had his 12 disciples. Jesus was, did not do ministry alone. He had things, uh, others with him. Verse 11 says, Also, uh, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, 
two can defend themselves, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The more you surround yourself with, and reality is, if you go somewhere with a Christian friend, you have less chance of backsliding, doing something, because they're, they're there with you. And they may be that little extra support that you need to keep you from turning back and doing something that you don't want. So serve and share in God's church. And again, when I use this word church, it's the body of Christ, not just Christian fellowship, but it does include Christian fellowship. Notice what Paul says. However, I consider my life worth nothing. He says, all I have, all I can do is worth nothing. In other words, unless I fulfill the purpose God has created me for. He says, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. And that task of testifying the good news of God's grace. And God gave him the uh, ministry to the Gentiles to spread the, the news of God's grace. But Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he has prepared for us in an advance. And my life will always be empty seem meaningless, lost, if I don't fulfill the purpose that God created you for. Those things that he's going to show you that you need in your life. So we'll close with this scripture. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you, who's that? Each of us, should use whatever gift you have received to do what? Serve others. Our motto, serving God by serving people. To serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. And until I surrender all my life to him, till I give it to him all, I'll never be happy. Until I start, again, take all the stuff you shouldn't be doing, give it to him and replace it with the things you should be doing. That's going to keep your life from feeling empty. See, so many times we just hear, don't do, don't, stop, stop, stop. But God, that's not really what God's saying. God's saying, don't do this, but do this. Replace it with something else. Quit serving the devil and serve God. Quit doing this and, and do this. Right? How I, I many of you know, we, we, when we were serving the, the devil, we could stay out all night long. But then once you become a Christian at 6 o'clock, you, you, you fall in asleep. Right? Didn't we give the devil a lot more energy and time than we're willing to give God? Oh, I can't go to Bible study. That's going to start till 7. When you're living for the world, you wouldn't even go out till 10. Because 7 was too early. Right? 10 o'clock is not too early for the devil, but 7 o'clock is too late for God. Let's stand to our feet. Amen. I just want chapter 47 to be a radical year that we give God our all. We give Him every part of our life. Amen. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity here right now, those watching online also, that if you come to the understanding that God loved you so much that He sent His Son to die on that cross for the forgiveness of your sins, to restore a relationship with you, but not only restore that relationship, but heal your life and that you surrender your life to him and fulfill the purpose that he's created you for. None of you are here by accident. The Bible is clear. When the, the biblical principle is that he knew you before you were formed in your mama's womb. And he already has your days planned. He already has a plan for you and a purpose. You didn't show up on this earth and God said, scratched his head and said, what am I going to do with this one? God already has a plan for your life. That's why you're here. So I just ask you right now, everyone, just to bow your heads and say this simple prayer of salvation. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. I believe that you love me so much that you sent your Son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of my sin. I ask Jesus to come into my heart and I receive the gift of salvation. 
and I want to live for you from this day forward. No more excuses. I'm going to make the breaks where I need to make the breaks, and I'm going to fill my life with you and serving you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone shouts, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Remember, ladies, quit making excuses. Tuesday night, you have some place to be if you want to. Right there, be, come to the Bible study, Wednesday night Bible study. Quit making excuses. You could be there. All right, I don't know if American Idol is still on, but you could record that and come to Bible study. <laughs>